Starship Flight 9 just cleared a major milestone. The FAA launch license was approved only hours before this video was released, bringing the mission closer than ever. But despite the regulatory green light, the hardware isn't fully ready. The launch vehicles are still under testing and repairs, raising questions about whether the vehicle can meet the upcoming launch window. Let's break down everything in detail. In a surprising move, Ship 35, assigned to Flight 9, was rolled back to SpaceX's Massey's test facility on Wednesday afternoon for yet another round of engine testing, a rare move this close to launch. This caught many off guard, as SpaceX had previously declared the vehicle flight ready following a long-duration static fire test conducted on May 12. But things changed quickly after that test. Just days later, a Raptor vacuum engine was seen exiting Mega Bay 2, the integration facility where Ship 35 had been undergoing final pre-launch preparations since the May 12 test. Evidence now suggests that this engine was pulled due to issues detected during or after that static fire. This wasn't the first time Ship 35 had to undergo an engine swap. During its first long-duration static fire on May 1st, an anomaly occurred inside the engine bay, causing bright flashes near the aft section toward the end of the test, potentially due to issues with the vacuum engines. Following that event, at least two Raptor vacuum engines were replaced and retested in the May 12th static fire. Now, another vacuum engine has been replaced after the second round of testing, signaling persistent reliability problems with the vacuum variants. The concern deepens as the Flight 8 in-flight anomaly was also traced to a vacuum engine. This raises questions about their design robustness and potential pogo oscillations. The issue with Raptor could also be related to the newly redesigned propellant feed system implemented in the Block 2 Starships. Unlike earlier Block 1 versions, which used a common downcomer to feed all six engines, Block 2 features separate methane lines for the vacuum engines, which could be introducing fluid dynamic instabilities or pressure transients that remain unresolved. Ship 35 underwent testing at Massey's on Friday morning. During the test, the ship's oxygen tank was fully filled, while the methane tank was partially loaded with propellants. After holding the vehicle in this cryogenic pressurized state for several minutes, both tanks were safely drained. Though not clearly visible in public footage, signs suggest SpaceX may have conducted a spin prime test on the newly installed vacuum engine during this time. In a spin prime, the engine's turbo pumps are spun to near flight speeds using cryogenic propellants without ignition to verify flow behavior, pump integrity, valve timing, and leak tightness. Road closure notices indicated Ship 35 would return to the production site Friday evening, implying the spin prime was deemed sufficient and no static fire was planned. Once back, the ship will undergo final checks and inspections before rollout to the launch site. Meanwhile, Ship 35's flight partner, Booster 14, has unexpectedly returned to the production site after spending over a week at the launch pad undergoing flight preparations. While SpaceX hasn't confirmed the reason, it's likely due to issues discovered during pad checkouts, requiring repairs or upgrades better handled at the production site. The booster is expected to return to the launch site once fixes are complete. Currently, SpaceX is targeting May 27th for Flight 9, according to several sources, including NOTAMs, U.S. Coast Guard hazard zones, navigational warnings, and a public notice issued by the city of Brownsville. But this date remains tentative, contingent on vehicle readiness and weather. On the regulatory front, the FAA approved Starship Flight 9 for launch on May 22, allowing SpaceX to resume operations after the Flight 8 mishap. This wasn't a quick sign-off, it followed a detailed investigation confirming that SpaceX had resolved the root causes of the previous failure and eliminated related safety risks. To authorize the return to flight, the FAA assessed key factors the nature of the mishap, the performance of safety-critical systems, and the potential threat from debris. Based on these, the license includes several updated requirements. SpaceX had to revise its flight safety analysis, incorporating data from all past flights, including worst-case scenarios and debris behavior. As a result, the FAA expanded hazard zones, both within the U.S. and internationally, to reflect the risk more accurately, especially since this mission reuses a previously flown Super Heavy booster. Also, to limit airspace disruption in case of anomalies like those in earlier flights, launches must now occur during off-peak aviation hours. The FAA also worked with international partners to ensure compliance with global safety and environmental standards. And finally, SpaceX must carry $500 million in liability insurance to cover potential damages from the mission. In short, the license isn't just a simple, go for launch. It's a carefully conditioned approval, built on technical corrections, stricter oversight, and multinational coordination for one of the most complex launch systems in the world.
Shifting the focus to SpaceX's second launch pad, Pad B, significant progress has taken place over the past week. With the orbital launch mount now installed, teams have begun securing it to the support legs and integrating it with surrounding systems such as propellant plumbing, electrical feeds, water deluge and key structural interfaces. Meanwhile, engineers kicked off a series of load validation tests on the chopstick arms using large water bags to simulate the operational loads the arms will experience during rocket stacking and catching operations. In the first two rounds, four water bags, two per arm, were each filled to about 100 tons, totaling a 400-ton simulated load. The arms were then lifted to their maximum height and held in position for about an hour. During this hold, sensors collected real-time structural data, measuring deflection, stress distribution, hydraulic pressures, and joint deformation to ensure the system remains within safe elastic limits. The goal here is to ensure the arms and tower structure remain within their elastic limits under both static and dynamic load conditions. The third round of testing introduced a completely new configuration, something SpaceX hasn't previously attempted at either pad A or B. Engineers attached long tension straps to both chopstick arms and raised them to their highest operational position. From these straps, eight water bags, each filled with about 35 tons, were suspended above ground level. This setup enabled precise control over the load by allowing the team to fill or drain individual bags through hoses during the test. This new test configuration allowed engineers to study not just static load behavior, but also dynamic effects like oscillation, torsional twist, sway damping, and load redistribution as fluid levels change. It's a valuable way to simulate real-world load unpredictability and refine the control algorithms for the chopstick arm actuators and hydraulic systems. More such tests with different configurations and higher loads are expected in the coming days. Teams have begun installing cladding on the launch tower, designed to shield internal hardware from hot gas impingement during liftoff. This progress suggests that Tower 2 is approaching full operational readiness. The booster quick disconnect gantry structure received some installations in the past days. The structure is actively being outfitted with vital hardware, including electrical and hydraulic systems, control valves, and fluid manifolds. Pad B will feature a dual QD architecture, as indicated by new alignment marks and interface points on the orbital launch mount. Future Super Heavy Booster variants will be equipped with two QD panels to connect with this updated design. This dual configuration enables faster and more balanced propellant loading, reduces the risk of overloading individual lines, and introduces redundancy. The current installations are laying the groundwork for activating this dual QD setup. At the production site, Ship 36 is receiving Raptor engines inside Mega Bay 2, preparing for a static fire ahead of Flight 10. Ship 37 is fully stacked and undergoing final integration, with teams installing hydraulics, avionics, and other critical systems before cryo-proof testing. Progress is also being made on Ship 38, where the liquid oxygen tank section was recently seen moving into Mega Bay 2 for stacking. Once the final aft section is stacked, the vehicle's primary structure will be complete. Then come the aft flaps, internal plumbing, hydraulics, electrical systems, and final prep for cryo-testing. In parallel, work has started on Booster 18, with ring sections being moved sequentially for stacking. SpaceX appears to have revised its booster generation naming recently. Boosters 18 and beyond are now classified as Block 3, as shown by a label on the new test tank 17 transport stand. This tank, currently at Massey's, is designed to test the latest internal and external design upgrades in the Block 3 booster's aft section. Meanwhile, boosters 14 to 17 are designated Block 2 because they pair with Block 2 starships for flight tests. However, they don't feature major design upgrades. The real next-gen improvements begin with booster 18, marking the start of Block 3. Please check out my earlier videos linked in the description for a detailed breakdown. SpaceX's McGregor rocket development facility saw a Raptor engine test anomaly on Wednesday morning. Although there's no official statement yet, the incident was likely caused either by an explosion of the next-generation Raptor V3 engine during testing or a malfunction in the test stand's ground support equipment. Fortunately, the fire was quickly contained and extinguished, limiting damage. This event underscores the inherent risks of advancing engine technology, but also demonstrates SpaceX's commitment to rigorous testing and swift problem resolution. For a detailed breakdown of the Raptor V3 engines, please refer to my previous video linked in the description. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology.
The Indian Space Research Organization faced a rare setback when the highly anticipated launch of its radar imaging satellite aboard a PSLV rocket failed. Let's break down what happened and what went wrong. The launch took place at the Satish Dhawan Space Center in Sriharikota, where the 44-meter-tall polar satellite launch vehicle, PSLV, lifted off as scheduled. This was ISRO's 101st mission from the Sriharikota launch pad and marked the 63rd flight of the PSLV. The rocket carried EOS-9, a synthetic aperture radar satellite designed for Earth observation, capable of operating day or night and seeing through cloud cover. It was intended for a 524 km sun-synchronous polar orbit to support applications like crop monitoring, deforestation tracking, urban mapping, and disaster management. The initial phases of flight unfolded flawlessly. The six strap-on boosters separated as planned, followed by the solid-fueled first stage, which burned for about 110 seconds. The second stage, powered by the liquid-fueled VCOS engine, took over seamlessly, operating normally for around 150 seconds while maintaining trajectory. However, the anomaly occurred during the ignition phase of the third stage, which uses solid propellant. About 100 seconds into its burn, onboard systems detected a sudden drop in chamber pressure. This led to a rapid loss of thrust, causing the vehicle to lose altitude and velocity while coasting downrange, roughly 900 kilometers over the Indian Ocean. Despite the anomaly, telemetry showed the third stage separated as planned, and the fourth stage, powered by two liquid-fueled engines, may have ignited. However, by that point, the vehicle had lost too much altitude and speed to achieve orbit. Mission Control initiated the flight termination system, destroying the vehicle and payload to avoid uncontrolled re-entry. Preliminary findings indicate the failure was due to an observation in the third stage, as stated by ISRO. While vague, this likely refers to an anomaly within the third stage propulsion system, possibly involving incomplete combustion, nozzle erosion, insulation failure, or a structural breach, all of which could drastically reduce performance. A failure analysis committee has been formed to investigate the root cause. PSLV failures are extremely rare. Before this, the rocket failed only twice, the 1993 maiden flight due to software issues, and in 2017 when a heat shield failed to separate, trapping the satellite inside the fairing. ISRO is expected to complete its investigation quickly and implement necessary design or procedural corrections. Given its track record of learning from setbacks, PSLV flights will resume with improved systems and renewed confidence. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.